This morning, we are going to be talking about prayer. And prayer is something that's so absolutely crucial to our relationship with God. It's crucial to um, any relationship to have communication, to have open communication, to not only be able to speak with someone, share your thoughts and feelings, but then also to hear what they have to say and be still and listen. And so we're going to um, just kind of break down prayer. Now, probably every single one of you in here pray. Probably every single one of you in here have a pretty clear understanding of prayer. Um, But hopefully, I'll be able to bring out some different points or maybe bring something back to your uh, remembrance, maybe that that you forgot, or just simply remind you um, of, of... how God wants to utilize this. So, before we get started, I'm going to pray too. Um, Not that Rod's prayer wasn't good enough, but I just, I want to pray for you guys as well. Holy Spirit, God, Father, I pray that you will just have your way here today, Lord. I pray that you will utilize me as a vessel to be able to deliver your message to your people that you want them to hear today. Change us with your word, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, according to the uh, Holman Illustrated Bible Dictionary, the definition of prayer is dialogue between God and people, especially his covenant partners. It's a dialogue between God, the Father, the creator of everything, and his people. We are his created. But he created us, as we know, in his image and in his likeness. He created us so that we could have a relationship with Him. And like I said, relationship comes whenever you have communication. Brittany just told me last night, we were talking about something, and she said, can you just listen and not give your opinion all the time? And I'm like, I've been working on that for almost 18 years. I don't know. I I know I need to, but I'm working on it. I'll get there, hopefully. Maybe um, when we get to heaven, I'm going to have a new created body, and and maybe by then, we can, you know, that'll work out. I don't know. No, but but in all honesty, it's, it's very, very important to be able to listen as well. That's how we learn who, who people are. That's how we understand their heart and their passions and their desires, and God has very intimate passions and desires for us. He has plans for us, and we're not going to know what those are if we don't talk to Him, if we don't communicate with Him, especially if we don't listen to Him. So part of prayer is a dialogue between God and people. A dialogue is not a one-way conversation. A conversation is not one-sided only, ever. That's just receiving instruction or or. Um, receiving someone's opinion, but dialogue goes back and forth, back and forth. So, today, as, as, as we're talking, I want you guys to think about perspective. Everything that we go over, I want you to think about what is your perspective of it? How do you think about it? Is it, is it positive? Is it negative? But there's so much that your perspective about something will change. So you can think, if you have a certain situation going on in your life, if you have a positive perspective about it, it's going to be so much easier for you. If if you look at that same situation in a negative way, um, you know, you could have a snag, you could look at something that's difficult and consider it a snag, or you can look at it and find the solution for it, right? Right? You can, you can let it keep you down, or you can let it push you forward to accomplish your tasks and purposes that you want to accomplish. If you, if you keep a, a negative perspective of it, then you're not going to try to work on it, right? But if you keep a positive perspective of it, then you're going to be willing to work on something so much longer. And then you will achieve what you set out to do. I promise. So there's a story that I recently heard, and I think that maybe some of you have heard it before, but maybe you haven't. So, lots of years ago, there was a shoe company, and they had, they had decided to send 
two different salespeople to Africa. They sent one to the east, side of, east coast of Africa, one to the west coast of Africa. And they, they were overall attempting to see what kind of success that they could have there. The one on the east coast, he writes back and he says, this is, this is an absolute waste of time. No one here wears shoes. And then the one on the west coast, he writes back and says, this is perfect. No one here wears shoes. Send me every single set of shoes that you can send me. They both were in the same place with the same set of circumstances, but they just had a different perspective, right? And so that's what we have to do. We're going to have different sets of circumstances in our life, and we simply have to determine what way we're going to look at it. So the reason I bring that up is because a couple weeks ago, I was praying about certain stuff that was going on in my life, and, and whenever I got down and, and I started to pray, I kind of felt like I was hitting this wall, you know? But I've, I've helped minister to people and walk them through hitting this wall time and time again, yet here I was hitting this wall, going, what is going on, man? And then God helped me realize what I was, what I was doing, and he, he even gave me instruction on what to do. So um, I was meeting with someone a little while before that, and they, they just encouraged me, whenever you hit that spot and you don't know what to pray or, or you just feel like you're hitting that wall, just pray in the Spirit. You know, literally, just let the Spirit pray for you. Because there's tons of times where we hit something and, and we feel like we don't know what to say. We don't know what to do. We don't, we don't know. We can't see what's beyond. So just pray in the Spirit and let Him do it. So I was doing that, and then I felt like He was telling me to, um, to pray the Lord's Prayer, which I will tell you, I don't always do that. Like, I believe that, that in communication... If I was to talk to Bill, and I said the exact same thing to Bill every single day, that wouldn't be a, that wouldn't be a good relationship, would it? You'd be like, man, you know, Briggs, you say the same thing every single time you see me. Like, let's change this up a little bit. So, but I will tell you that I do think that there's a lot of power in praying something that Jesus himself told us. And so, I will, I do that quite a bit. And I just insert myself in there and, and pray it over myself. And I'm going to, I am going to start breaking down um, the Lord's Prayer a little bit. And hopefully, we'll bring some stuff out of it that maybe you guys haven't seen before. Or you haven't maybe considered it from this angle. And if it's for you, great, take it. If you think, man, that guy's nuts, then okay, that's fine too. Lots of people think that, so that's perfectly fine. But before we get to breaking it down... I want to talk about some of the different kinds of prayer first. And there are, there are more than this, but this is just kind of five, um, what I would consider to be basic prayer types or basic prayer styles. So the first is blessing and adoration. Blessing and adoration. And what that is, is in prayers of adoration, we praise God and acknowledge our dependence on Him. That's prayers of, of blessing and adoration. Um, another one is petition. In prayers of petition, we ask God for things we need both spiritually and physically. So we're asking Him for something. Those are prayers of petition. We're petitioning Him for something. Then there's intercessory prayer, prayers of intercession. In prayers of intercession, we make requests to God on behalf of other people. So that's what we were doing up here this morning with Trinity. We were interceding for her, that God would move in her life. We're asking um, for something on her behalf or someone else's behalf. And then, prayers of thanksgiving. I probably should have put that one first, honestly, because if you guys remember the last time I talked, um, I talked about how important it is to enter his courts with praise and, and thanksgiving being thankful for what you've got, and praising Him for who He is. That's kind of the first step. In prayers of thanksgiving, we thank God for the good things in our lives. Praise. Praise is another form of prayer. In, praise, uh, in, in prayers of praise, we express our love for God, the source of all love. So we're praising Him for who He is. 
we thank Him, we praise Him, we petition, we intercede, and then we bless and give adoration. Those are just a few different styles of prayer. Now, there's also, um, you know, like healing prayers, prayers like that. Um, there's, there's so much. It's, it is pretty broad, but I will tell you, in the, in the amount of time that I have, I'm going to just kind of hit stuff as much as I can. And I expect you guys to want to dig into this more for yourself because there is so much more here than what I can possibly bring this morning. When you're getting ready to pray, I, I can't stress enough that I, I want you to keep a positive outlook on things. And I truly believe that if you keep a positive outlook on things, it's going to change the course of your prayers. It's going to change the course of your prayers. It's going to change the course of your life. Ephesians 5.16 says, Make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. I'm telling you, the best way you can make the most of every opportunity is to include God in that opportunity. Include God in the moment, especially in these days that are evil. So, like I said, I sit down and I'm talking to God and he says, go through the Lord's Prayer. And I'm like, okay, cool, that's easy enough. I've got to memorize, no big deal, I can do this. So I start praying. I'm going to read through this first and then we're going to break it down and dissect it a little bit, okay? Hope that you guys are okay with me reading. We're going to start in uh, verse 6. This is in um, Matthew. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Guys, this is, this is Jesus talking to us, telling us how to pray. Can it get any better than that? the Son of the Most High God. He is God, and He's telling us how to pray to the Father. This is exciting. This is amazing. Just like in John chapter 17, it's, it's Jesus praying for us. I love that. And then this is Jesus telling us how to pray. He says, so, then this is how you should pray. He starts out, Our Father who is in heaven, Holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth here as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts or our sins as we also have forgiven our debtors or those who have sinned against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive others when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. That's, that's a promise to us. But it, then he says, But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Whew. Oh my goodness. There is so much here. There is so much right here. Let's break it down a little bit. So let's go back up. He says, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. So he's breaking it down for us. Pray to your heavenly Father. He's giving one example of prayer here. He's saying, the reason that he's saying this is because the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they would walk around and they would yell loudly all these prayers and, and, and chant these prayers and stuff so that everyone would see them so that they would get glory from the people that were seeing them. 
It wasn't about them communicating with God. It was about them making themselves look good while they supposedly communicated with God. That's not what God wants. God wants that relationship, right? The relationship where we're speaking with Him. So He says, go into a room where nobody else is. To me, that says, get somewhere where you're not going to be distracted. So you can focus on me. That's what that says to me. Go somewhere so you're not distracted so you can focus on me. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Does it say he'll probably reward you? He might reward you? No. He says he will reward you. That's a big word in there. There's only four letters in it, but will means a promise for you. If you do this, this will happen. He will reward you when you do this. Then he says, And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Now, he said babbling on like pagans. Do you remember? Um, I believe it was Elijah with the altar, and he poured all the water on it. Elijah, right? He's, he's going up against 400 different prophets of Babel, or of, um, of Baal. 400 different prophets. Do you remember what they did to try to get God's attention? They're crying, they're, they're, they're calling out to their God, they start cutting themselves and stuff for hours and hours and hours. And their God didn't respond. Of course, he's not going to respond. He's not real. But... But then Elijah comes up, pours the water all over this altar. It's like standing water around. And he prays to heaven and asks God. And God sends down lightning and consumes the rocks, the wood, the the sacrifice. And even the word says that it lapped up all the water that was in the trench around it. He didn't keep on going. But I'm not saying don't ask for something more than once. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm not saying that you should just be like, Hey God, this is what I need. Thanks. Talk to you later. That's not it. I'm talking get alone in your room, have communication with him, but know and trust that your God, whenever you do this, he's going to reward you. He's going to answer your prayers. He's saying, don't just sit there and just ramble on about absolutely nothing. Then I love this part. Verse 8, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Oh, Oh, isn't that good? Your Father knows what you need. Even when I didn't know what I needed, He knew. I can sit there and try to um, take care of myself prepare everything for myself for what I think should be the outcome, but my Father already knows what He wants my outcome to be, what, he, what I need it to be. Those of you who have children in here, you know what your children need before they even ask. Why? Because we've been there, we've done that, we've seen it, we've experienced it. God gave us those experiences so that we could take care of them. But in doing so, We need to understand that that's how He wants to take care of us too. But He knows better than we even know for our children. He knows what we need more than that. So He says, your Father knows what you need before you even ask Him. I love it. He's like, He's this Father that loves us so much that's just sitting there. Come on, ask. Ask me. I'm ready to give it to you. I want to give it to you. I'm going to give it to you. Let's do this. It's yours. Here you go. You got that and more. The word says that he opens up the windows of heaven and pours out blessing on you that you can't even contain until your cup is overflowing. You can't even contain it. That's how much he wants to bless you when you ask. But it says that he knows what you need before you ask. It doesn't say that he gives you what you need before you ask, does it? Isn't it interesting how it doesn't say that? He's not going to give it to you before you ask because He wants you to trust Him. He wants you to come to Him. It's not a one-way relationship. It's two-way. 
Verse 9. This then is how you should pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for showing me. Because if he didn't show me, how would I know how to do it? I'd have to guess on my own, right? But he knew what I needed before I asked. So he showed me and you how to pray. He lays it out right here. He says, our Father in heaven, our, Jesus said, our Father. He didn't say, pray like this, my Father, and exclude them. He said, our Father. That means the same Father to Jesus is your Father. That means you can accept that as your own. Accept it as your own. You haven't been kicked out of the family. He's your Father. Yours and mine. Mine and yours. Your Father in heaven. Holy is your name. Remember who you're talking to. Remember who you're talking to. Show him some respect. He's holy. Keep his name holy. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done. So if all we're bringing to Him is demands for Him to do our will, where does that put us in line with what Jesus tells us to do and how He tells us to pray? That's not what He's telling us to do. Above everything, acknowledge who He is and be seeking Him be seeking His face and His will. And His will be done above ours, above our own. You know the Word says to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and then all things will be added unto you? There's a first. This has to be done first. This has to be done first. And then all things will be added unto you. Your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus is asking us, telling us, that the way to pray is for God's will to be done here on earth just like it is in heaven. When Satan tried to rise up against Jesus, and he took the third of the angels with him, he tried to rise up, but God's will stood. Not Satan's will. Not the third of the angels that went with Satan, but God's will stood. That's what prevailed. God's will in heaven, just like here on earth. That's what he's asked, telling us to pray. And then he says, give us today our daily bread. Now, in John chapter 6, we've been going over the fact that Jesus is telling the people that he is the bread of life that He is the bread of life and that He will give up His flesh for all of us to be able to know Him, to have a relationship with Him. But Jesus says, I am the bread from heaven. Eat my flesh, drink my, my blood. He's not talking about cannibalism. He's talking about I, me, my life. What I'm doing for you is the spiritual bread that you're going to need that's going to sustain you and allow you to live forever. But only that way will you be allowed to live forever. So he's saying, give us today our daily bread. Did you know that God fed the children of Israel as they left Egypt with manna and with quail? He gave them their, their physical daily bread. He provided it for them. They asked, Moses went and asked, and God provided it. But they also needed the spiritual bread, and God provided it through Jesus. And we get to eat both. He's going to take care of us physically and spiritually. But he says to pray for it. Ask me for it, and I'll give it to you. But he's telling us right here, ask for it. Give us today our daily bread, physical and spiritual. And forgive us our sins, as we have also forgiven our uh, those who have sinned against us. Guys, let me tell you, this was the brick wall that I was hitting. 
This was what I couldn't get past. My own sins and guilt of my own sins. I've been a Christian for lots of years, many years. I love God. I've got a relationship with Him. And Satan still gets at me. He's still whispering in my ears, you're not good enough. You just did this. You know it's a sin. It's in the Word. It says you can't do this. It's right here. And he's constantly making me, making me think, you can't come to God. You can't, you can't do that. But here's what, here's what Jesus pointed out to me, and I want you to get this. If you don't get anything else today, please get this. Lord, help me to deliver this the way you want it. I'm reading through, I'm, I'm not reading through, I'm praying through the Lord's Prayer. And as I get to that part, forgive me my sins. And as soon as I said sins, Jesus said, do you see how far down the list I put forgive my sins? Was that number one? No. Was it number two? No. Was it number three? No. Was it number four? No. And I'm like, what? What? And he goes, look where it is. Look how far down it is. Look at all the things that I tell you before I tell you to ask for forgiveness of your sins. He said, it's just not that important because Jesus, what Jesus did for you, already forgave your sins. You've confessed your sins. That's not what's the most important here. What's most important is me and your relationship with me and coming to me even when you feel like that you can't. Even when you feel like that what you've done is hindering you from coming to me. Just come to me. Look how far down the list it is. He said, I did that strategically for a purpose. So you wouldn't think that you needed to overcome all of your sins in your own life by yourself before you could come to me. And I'm going, ha, 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 ha. thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Guys, this is, this is so mind-blowing. So mind-blowing. I absolutely love it. But even though, even though that's not my first priority, you know what even comes before that? God knows that we need to do something. We want to do something in order to be able to get this done, right? In order to be able to accomplish it. So he says, as you forgive those who who have sinned against you. First, forgive them, and then come ask me for forgiveness. You have to do this first. Ask me for forgiveness before you ask. Um, uh, forgive those who have sinned against you before you come and ask me for forgiveness. And then he hits it again at the very end. That is, that's crucial though, guys. I can't get off that quite yet. That's crucial. Who in here has had somebody that's sinned against you? Every single one of us. Every one of us. Who in here has not sinned against someone else? Exactly. I've sinned probably against almost every single one of you, even. You know? Honestly. We're human beings. People get so caught up on the fact that people have sinned against them. Well, they treated me this way. They did this to me. They did this to me. I can't, I can't get over that. Can everybody get over everything you've done to them? We're not perfect. Thank you, Jesus, that you've made us perfect through you, through what you've done, but not by what we've done. Not by what we've done. Guys, there are other people out there that have probably thought, man, I can't believe Nathan did that to me. I can't get over it. In fact, I know there's people out there because they still treat me that way. You know? But I've got to learn to forgive myself for those things too. But I've really got to forgive them for sinning against me before God's going to grant my forgiveness. Guys, it's an absolute must. We've got to forgive those who sin against us. Now, this is another thing that's pretty cool. It's more than pretty cool. It's super stinking cool. And lead us not into temptation. Jesus tells us to pray 
that God won't lead us into temptation. People are like, God's not going to lead you into temptation. Then why would Jesus tell us to pray that God wouldn't lead us into temptation? Isn't that crazy? Lead us not into temptation. Don't lead us somewhere where we're going to be tempted. We're going to be tempted pretty much anywhere that we go. But Jesus is telling us here, ask Him to not lead us into that. I think that maybe a more clear representation of that would be, God, whenever I'm led into temptation, whenever I go somewhere where you know I'm going to be tempted, God, protect me from that. Help me to not fall into that temptation. Help me to not stumble. Help me to not fall down again when I get tempted in that area. You know, the Word tells us that a righteous man falls down seven times and gets back up. That falling down, that's, it means stumbling. It means falling into temptation. It means that they've, they've done something that they know they shouldn't have done. Yet they get back up and they continue on. They trust that God is who He says that He is and that He will take care of them. He will provide for them, for us, for me, for you. And then He goes on and says, listen to this, this is crazy, but deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us from the evil one. Jesus is telling us to ask God to deliver us from evil. Do we need delivered if we're not, captor, if we're not captives of something evil? You don't need delivered if you aren't already captured by something. Jesus says, deliver us, but deliver us from the evil one. At this point, Jesus hadn't been uh, crucified on the cross. He didn't go down and remove Satan's authority from him and then ascend to the Father. At this point, that hadn't happened. We were well in the grips of Satan at that point. Satan is still trying to keep you in his grips. And God tells us, Jesus tells us, ask the Father to deliver you from this. But you can't be delivered from something that you aren't already captured by. It's huge. I love it. So, Jesus says this, and then he goes on and says, for if you forgive other people... Where did, where did that come from? We're back on forgiving? We're back on forgiving? Like we already, we already covered that, and then we went on to something else. Or did we go on to something else? Or was Jesus talking about the very same thing? He says, and forgive us our sins, as we also have forgiven those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation. Maybe that temptation is to hold on to those sins. Deliver us from the evil one. Maybe the delivering that we need from, that we, the thing that we need delivered from, is, is holding a fence against people and not forgiving them first. Maybe that's why he goes straight into verse 14 and says, For if you forgive other people, if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. If you do this, he will do this. If you do this, he will do this. And then he says, but. Mm. Oh, that, that but is always like, hey, here's, here's, here's the catch. This is the truth. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. Who knows that... that what Jesus speaks is absolute truth. It's absolute truth. But people say, um, well, I've accepted him as my Lord and Savior, you know, and so I'm good. I'm good now. But he's telling us that if we do not forgive others their sins, our sins will not be forgiven. Sins cause separation separation from God. We've got to be forgiven from those. This is an extremely important thing. That's why it takes so much of the prayer that Jesus is telling us how to pray.
Now, with the Lord's Prayer, we just read it in order. We read it the way that Jesus delivered it. And this, that prayer is found in Matthew and Luke, and then it's also found in another, um, another deal. It's not in the Bible, but it's... Um, Man, I wish I would have written that down. What'd you say? That thing. Yeah, I can't pronounce it. So that's probably why I didn't write it down. So I can't pronounce it. I'm like, I'm going to look like an idiot up there. But it's also listed there. And it's, I mean, almost verbatim exactly um, in the book of Matthew, like it is in the book of Matthew. But if you, if you get this backwards, then it's self-focused. You notice that, that the Lord's Prayer starts with focusing on God. But if you flip it around, then it's backwards and you're focusing on yourself. That's not good. That's absolutely not good. He wants us to focus on Him first. Like I said, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And then even uh, King David said, You say, seek my face, Lord. And I say, your face I will seek. That was King David, the man after God's own heart. God told him to seek my face, and he says, you know what? I am going to seek your face. That's exactly what I'm going to do. That's why God blessed him so much, because he was obedient, and he would listen. Now, I will tell you that he's still a merciful God, even if you're getting it backwards, even if you're coming to him broken, hurting, in pain. And we're going to go through why he still listens to those things. But I will tell you, he's still a merciful God. But there's not sustained growth if you try to go backwards. We want to continue forward. We want to continue to grow and evolve and mature into people that truly represent God, that resemble God and His grace, and His love, and His mercy. But if we go at it backwards and we're self-focused, He's still merciful, but we're not going to have sustained growth. We're going to feel like that there's growth there, but as soon as we get that prayer answered, what do, are we going to continue to seek Him? No. And you know how I can say no so confidently? It's because I've done it. He's answered prayers whenever I was selfishly asking for them. He has. He's come through. But I did not have sustained growth through that. I didn't. It's an absolute guarantee. So what can make prayers ineffective? Now, I will tell you, this is not a comprehensive list that I put together. It's, it's absolutely not. But I wanted to hit on a couple things just to throw them out there. The first thing that people think of whenever they think, what can make my prayers ineffective is they think sin. Sin can make my prayers ineffective. I will tell you, 100% that is incorrect. That's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. And let me show you why. Uh, I'm going to break it down in kind of a, an interesting way here, but Second Chronicles 7.14, if you want, you can turn there, but I'm going to hit it and get right back off of it. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. Did you, did you, did you see how that, that course evolved there? He says, if they humble themselves and pray. you got to humble yourself but first before you're even going to pray. You've got to. You know, you've got to get to a place where you realize, God, I can't do this. I can't do it on my own. I realize I can't do it on my own. Humble yourself and pray. Seek my face. That's what he says. You humble yourself, you pray, but the first thing you do in prayer is you seek my face. That's, a, that's what you do. That's how you're going to get it. Seek my face and turn from your wicked ways. Don't continue down the path that you were going. You humbled yourself. You knew you needed God. You knew you needed the answer. Well, stop doing what you were doing to get you in the position that you were in. There's, there's like a, a, a light bulb moment, right? 
You can't keep doing the same thing and expect different results. That's just not how it works. It's simply not. So, seek my face and turn from your wicked ways. Then, that's where the then comes in. Then, I will hear from heaven. Hear from heaven? You, you're going to hear from heaven? I'm the one praying, but you're going to hear from heaven? I'm going to come back to that. You guys are going to like it. Hopefully. I like it. I think it's exciting. Hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sins, and will hear their, heal their land. So pride and arrogance are two main things, two of really the most main things that will keep you, hinder you from having your prayers answered. If you're proud, you're not going to humble yourself enough to even seek God's face, enough to try to go after this God that promises that He's going to love you and protect you and care for you, and then arrogance, thinking that you can do it on your own. Now, for all the, all the men in here that have a Bible, I'd like the men to open this up. Ladies, this doesn't necessarily pertain to you, but it does pertain to the men. And one of these days, I'm going to pray, or I'm going to teach a message specifically for men on relationship, and especially relationship with their wives and how they should treat their wives, because it's extremely important. And in 1 Peter 3, verse 7, 1 Peter 3, verse 7, gentlemen, in the same way, you, husbands, must give honor to your wives, treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Here's what I want you to hear, men. Hear it loud and clear. Treat her as you should, so your prayers will not be hindered. What? What? The way I treat my wife is going to affect you listening to me or not? Yes. That's black and white. I mean, it's literally in the Bible, guys. I didn't, like, add that in there myself. How you treat your wife will affect God hearing you. Now, that's so very important. It's extremely important. And I know men are like, well, she's my wife. She has to do what I say. Well, boy, you better check yourself. You better check yourself quick. Because in our relationship, we represent how God loves the church, people, men, women. We represent God, and how, how we treat our wives is how the rest of the world that don't know God, that's how the rest of the world knows God how loving and caring God is by how we treat our wives. That's how they're going to see it. And that's why God says, if you don't treat her right, they're going to have a misconception of who I am and how I love them. It's our role first. Our role first. And how they respond, how they act or react, is, is ultimately up to us, and it's on our shoulders. And that's why it's so important that we have to treat them right so our prayers will not be hindered. So, hope you all wrote that down. God hears you. God does hear you. He does hear you. He hears the cries of the suffering and the brokenhearted even when we don't feel like He does. He hears us even when we don't feel like he does. Let me prove it to you. If you want, you can look this up. You don't have to. Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. During that long period, this is right after Joseph was, was in Egypt. You know, that Joseph was sold into slavery and all that stuff, and then he went to, to prison, and then he came out, and he... He um, told, told Pharaoh his dream, and he was made second in command of all of Egypt. And then he got to bring his family, and, and this is after Joseph dies, several years after he dies, and so much longer that 
that the pharaohs and the royalty at that point didn't even really remember what had happened. Didn't know why the Hebrews were in Egypt. All they knew is the Hebrews are, are being very blessed for some reason, and they're growing exponentially, and so they have to do something about it because the Egyptians feel like that the Hebrews will take over if there's a war. So that just brings you up to speed here. Exodus 2, 23 through 25. During that long period, the king of Egypt died, the one who knew Joseph and his family. The Israelites groaned in their slavery. They had been placed into slavery so that they could be controlled so that they wouldn't take over Egypt. But in their slavery, keep in mind, they've been in Egypt for a long time, a very long time. And Egypt was, uh, had so many different kinds of weird, crazy gods, like hundreds of them. So as, as they're in slavery, they're not getting to experience this relationship with God. So that has drifted away, but they start crying out to the God that they remember of their ancestors. They start crying out, and their cry for help, because of their slavery and suffering, did you hear that? Because of their slavery and suffering, went up to God. It says that it went up to God. These people didn't even have a relationship with Him necessarily. But they started crying out because they, they were helpless. They needed God. Genesis 4, verses 2 through 10. This is a super interesting story, and the story reveals how God sees and knows intimately what's going on in your life. And even when things that are unfair happen to you, He still knows and He hears it. And He still deals with it. Genesis 4, 2 through 10. Now Abel kept the flocks, and Cain work the soil. Let me, let me step back for one second, okay? Hear me out. This is after Adam and Eve ate the fruit and were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. After that. You know, whenever we read through that, don't you think, oh, well, they were kicked out. Now God's like, Psh, you're kicked out. Get out. Don't come back. I'm not paying your bills. I'm not paying for your gas and your insurance. I'm not feeding you. I'm not doing all this. Right? Right? I mean, isn't that what you naturally think? You think God kicked them out? He even put an angel with a flaming sword at the door so they couldn't come back into the garden. That's how much he didn't want them in the garden. But here's what's crazy. He didn't leave them. He's still talking to them. You know, after they sinned and he kicked them out, God killed an animal and made clothing for them. I bet those were super cool clothing. I mean, God made their clothing for them. He, I bet that was really neat. But he loved them so much that he's still taking care of them. They're outside of the garden. So much so he's taking care of them and still communicating with them, still having relationship with them so much so that it says, and Abel also brought an offering. So, so Cain worked the soil and Abel kept the flocks. God had told them to bring to bring offering to him. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruit of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. I think that it's really interesting because most people, they, whenever they read this and they look at it, and I, I'm, I'm guilty of it too, is they think, well, Cain brought something too, and Abel brought something. Cain worked the land. Abel, Abel brought the meat, you know? But it says, it says very specifically, Cain brought some of the fruit. Like he's like, no, I'll take this for him and this and this, and that's good enough. And goes and provides that as an offering. But Abel provides the fatty portion, the best. What tastes the best, smells the best, that's what he brought. He's like, I'll take what's left over, God. You take the good stuff. No, that's not how, um, that's not how Cain brought his. And so, they go on, and it says, But of Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. It's talking about God. He did not look with favor, so Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? 
If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? So God had already laid out his expectations for him. He already knew what was right. He knew what he was supposed to do, but he didn't do it. So God says, specifically ask him, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you did what was right, will you not be accepted? He would have been accepted. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. Sin is crouching at your door, ready to pounce on you if you don't do what's right. You're setting yourself up for failure. You're setting yourself up for sin to come in and destroy. That's what God specifically is telling him right now. It's crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. You must rule over it. This is what you've got to do. When it's crouching at the door, you've got to rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out in the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord came back to him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where's your brother Abel? Isn't it interesting that God went to him and asked him and gave him an opportunity? He gave him an open door to confess. I think things would have turned out way different if he would have jumped on that chance. He's sitting here talking to God. He knows God created everything. He knows who God is. And he's still sitting there like, "Mm, I'm not going to tell you the whole truth right now. The Lord said to Cain, where's your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? (laughs) Uh, That's why I said in the beginning, know who you're talking to. Recognize who you're talking to especially if he has the authority that God has. The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Abel, who was killed, no longer was able to cry out. But his blood cried out to God. The fact that Cain stepped outside and let that sin that was crouching at the door overcome him, take him, and let his, his, his anger and his jealousy rule. Whenever he made that act, God knew it. God knew it. And God acted on Abel's behalf. Now, that's how you can know that God hears you. God does hear you even when things aren't fair, when somebody does something to you that you didn't deserve, God knows. He absolutely knows. So from the moment you first prayed, this is outstanding. I love this. Daniel 10, 11 through 13. I'll try to wrap this up pretty quick, guys. Daniel 10, 11 through 13. He said, this is a... um, Daniel, God was giving Daniel a vision, and God let him see an absolute angel, an actual angel. Let him see it. Some of us um, are able to discern spirits. Some of us can prophesy. Some of us, you know, we all have these different gifts. Daniel was able to see this angel. God opened his eyes, let him see this angel, and the angel is speaking to Daniel that God sent to him. God sent to him. He said, Daniel, you are very precious to God. Consider carefully the words I am about to speak to you. (laughs) That's, That's a clue. You better listen. Stand up, for I have now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. I would have been trembling too, no doubt, bumbling around like, oh. Then he continued, do not be afraid. That's the first thing he says. Look. If you're all struck with fear, you're not going to be able to listen to what I'm saying. Get yourself together. Listen, it's important what I'm getting ready to tell you. Do not be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. I'm going to read that again because if you missed it, you really need to hear this. This this lays it out for you. This is so amazing. 
Verse 12. Then he continued, do not be afraid. Since the first day that you did what? That you set your mind to gain understanding. You wanted to know God. You wanted to understand him. And to humble yourself, he set his mind to understand and to know God. And he set his mind to humble himself before his God. Those are the two things that he did. Humbled himself, set his mind to know God. Your words were heard. When he decided to do that, if we decide to do that, our words will be heard from that moment that we make the decision. The moment that you make the decision, your words will be heard. And I have come in response to them. This this angel is coming to respond on Daniel's behalf. That's, That's what happens? Seriously? Whenever we, whenever we set our mind to understand God, whenever we humble ourselves, He's going to hear us and He's literally going to respond and He's going to send what I need when I need it? That's, that's amazing. Now, here's the thing though. Verse 13, it says, But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me for 21 days. Have you ever asked for something and it didn't happen just like that? And you're like, well, God didn't hear me. I must, he must not love me. I'm asking, you know, I love him. I've set my heart to understand him. I've even humbled myself and I'm praying the way that I'm supposed to. Why have 21 days gone by? God clearly doesn't want to answer my prayer. What I would like you to consider is that maybe something's holding that up. That you know that we, we don't battle against flesh and blood, but but we battle against the powers and principalities of darkness that are in this world. They are in this world. It's an absolute fact. And that's what we battle against. And when God is coming on our behalf, sometimes the enemy doesn't want that answer to get there because you're going to be more powerful, because you're going to change the world when you do what he's wanting you to do, when you're obedient. The devil doesn't want you to. So naturally, he's going to put something there to try to stop that. When he knows this guy loves God, wants to know God more, he's set his heart to know God more, and he's humbled himself, so I know that God's going to answer that. So I'm going to respond to try to block that, to try to stop that. So this says the Persian kingdom, the prince of the Persian kingdom. This wasn't some little demon. This wasn't some, uh, some small demon. This was a prince over an entire area, an entire area where people are struggling with lust and sin and, uh, you know, murder and and all these different things. He's ruling all that stuff. That's how big this, this one that was trying to resist this angel that was coming to answer Daniel's prayer was. When you're obedient to God and you are going to make those changes, you are a force to be reckoned with. But you're going to be reckoned with you're going to experience these things, these struggles. And it may take a little bit of time before the breakthrough comes. Don't give up. So you know earlier, whenever I said, don't keep on babbling like the, like the other people do. See? See what I mean by that's not what I'm talking about? This, whenever you're in this place, God wants you to continue. Continue to pray. Continue to seek His face. Don't get discouraged and don't think that he's not who he says that he is just because you're not getting the response immediately. That's not what we can do here. That's not what we've been called to do. That's not what we're instructed to do in his word. We've got to press on. So, he says that I got held up by the, um, the prince of Persia. He resisted me for 21 days. Then Michael, somebody bigger and badder than me and bigger and badder than that dude, came. Probably because Daniel continued to pray. More more answers needed to come. Michael was those more answers, and he was there to resist that guy. So, Michael came, one of the chief princes, a chief prince, one of God's chief princes, is going to be able to overcome the prince of the Persian kingdom. He came to help me because I was detained with the spirit over the prince of the kingdom of Persia. That's amazing. So, let's move on. 
Now I want to describe to you in great detail what happens whenever you pray, whenever you've already done those things, you've humbled yourself, you're seeking God's face, and you're being obedient and you're praying to Him. Revelations 4, 3 through 5. I would recommend that you write this down so that you can go back and look it up yourself because you're going to be going, this dude's nuts. What's he talking about? So, Revelations 4, verses 3 through 5. The scene, let me set the stage for you. This scene is taking place in heaven, and it happens. It is going on. It's in heaven, God, the angels. Then another angel with a gold incense burner. It's a gold burner that sends up sweet-smelling aromas, came and stood at the altar. The altar in heaven. We're in heaven. An angel with an incense burner comes up, and he's standing there, and a great amount of incense was given to him. He's given incense to mix with the prayers of God's people as an offering on the gold altar before the throne. First time I heard this, I'm like, I'm kind of a visual person, you know, and I'm, I'm starting to hear this, and I'm like, why does the angel have incense? And he's mixing incense with our prayers so that they will be a sweet aroma to our Father God. The prayers that are being sent up by us, this is what's happening to them. They are literally being taken. They're being mi mixed with incense of the prayers of God's people as an offering on the altar before the throne. Verse 4, the smoke of the incense mixed with the prayers of God's holy people ascended up to God from the altar where the angel had poured them out. He pours them out and they're going up to God. You're praying, they're going up there, he's mixing them and then that is rising up to God. That's how God is receiving your prayers. Then the angel filled the incense burner with fire from the altar, which is where our prayers are, mixed with the incense. He fills up this incense burner with fire from the altar and threw it down upon the earth. He threw the answers down upon the earth and thunder crashed, lightning flashed, and there was a great earthquake. What is that thunder and lightning and the earthquake? It's the results that you're asking for. It's the answer to your prayers. And, and look at how powerful they are. Did you, did you catch that? Listen, it says, they're so powerful, they thundered. Lightning flashed and a great earthquake. Some versions say, and a terrible earthquake. Can you hear thunder? Yes. Even if you're deaf, you can feel thunder. Have you ever been close to thunder? And it hits, and you, you literally hear it shake your windows. It shakes the house. You think something just exploded somewhere, but it was just thunder. But lightning does things, doesn't it? Thunder will set off car alarms. Thunder can literally break windows. Lightning will rip trees in half, start forests ablaze. It's got to be pretty, pretty hot to light a forest on fire when it's raining because that's typically when, when lightning's happening. That's how, that's how much power and authority is in your answered prayers. And earthquakes, enough to split the earth open. If you think that God isn't coming on your behalf, listen to this. Take it in and accept it for yourself. This is the powers that your prayers have. When somebody says, I'll be praying for you. And you're like, oh, are you really going to pray? If you say it, you dang well better pray. Because your prayers have power. They get mixed with that incense. They go up as a pleasing aroma to God. They get stirred together and cast back down. Guys, that's why it's so important when you say you're going to pray for people, pray for them. Whenever people think, well, all I can do is pray. All you can do is pray. Are you kidding me? That's the number one best thing you can do. You can't do anything close to what God can do without His power. 
Not even close. Nothing you can do without God's power is going to help. But when God gives you the power and the authority, because He has, take that authority. Use it. Pray. Pray. It's extremely important, and it's extremely powerful. One of my good friends, he's the um, vice president of operations where I work, and he always prays this over, over us, over our company, over the people in our company, our employees. He prays it over me. He prays it over our owner. He prays it over our families. He prays it over um, everybody that's involved, our clients, everybody that we train, everybody that we protect, all of them. He's praying this all the time, and it's so powerful. 1 Chronicles 4, 9 through 10. 1 Chronicles 4, 9 through 10. You've heard about this before. It's called the prayer of Jabez. Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. Brothers must not have been real good dudes to make the Bible like that. His mother had named him Jabez, saying, I gave birth to him in pain. That's unfortunate. But, you know... Most children do cause pain in birth, but uh, um, Jabez, this is going through like a chronological order, and when it, it, it and it's just this is the son of this person, this is the son of this person, this is the son of this person, and then then it gets to Jabez and makes a break in all of that. That's how important this guy is. That's how much God wanted us to hear this prayer. Okay, it says Jabez cried out. He cried out to God of Israel. Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And God granted his request. So, my boss, he prays over us. He says, Lord, I pray that you will bless, bless us, that you will enlarge our territory, that your hand will always be with us, that you will keep us from harm and that I, that we will be free from pain. And God granted his request. That's a good prayer. I mean, it really is. And I encourage you guys, you know, I've given you a couple different prayers to be able to, uh, to pray, or at least some guidance and some direction in where you might be going if you feel like you're hitting a wall. These are some great things to do. These are some great uh, prayers to be able to pray over yourself, over your family. But my prayer for you guys today is that you will know the Lord and that you'll be known by the Lord. That's my prayer for you. That you will have clear and open communication with Him and that you will seek and strive for His face every single day of your life. That's where true change is going to come from. So, with that, I'll wrap it up. Um, we are going to play a couple songs after this, but if anybody here doesn't know the Lord, doesn't have that relationship with Him, but you want it, or you want a deeper relationship with Him, then come up afterwards. Come up, or even just get one of us. We'll come and, and we'll, we'll come and pray with you. If you're sick, if you're um, brokenhearted, if you need to pray for someone else, we'll pray for someone else with you. No problem. But if you want to have a true relationship with God, if you want to have this, this power and this ability that he's freely given you, accept it. Take it. If you're not happy with where you are in life, seek the only one that can change it. The only one that will change it. And that's him. Him and him alone. Um, if you want to stay in here for, uh, for prayer and some, some worship time, feel free. You don't have to stick around. You can feel free to leave if you just want to conversate and stuff, you can conversate out in the foyer there. And, um, and I love you guys. So let's pray real quick. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for your word. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the power that you've given us. Lord, your word says that you've given us the power to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons in your name, Lord. Thank you so much for that. Your word says that by your stripes, we are healed. By the acts that you've done, Lord, we are healed. And you've granted us the same authority. Lord, we thank you for that, God. I pray that, that everyone within the sound of my voice will accept the authority that you have given them and that, that, that they will seek your face, Lord. 
that they will seek you for all that you are. Lord, may everything that we do just glorify your name, and God, help us to never forget the sacrifices that you made so that we could have an open relationship with you, God. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.